Hello and welcome to ILTV's Insider. I'm Arian Porras and our main topic tonight, the 2022 World Cup Tournament in Qatar. Some one and a half million visitors from all over the world, including Israel, are making their way to Doha for the games and the energy of excitement is understandably palpable. But the FIFA Championships is coming at an incredibly high cost as Qatar's hosting of the games is based on the backs of bribery, scandal, slavery and a litany of other human rights abuses. So what's it all for, and what happens next? With me to discuss is senior editor at the Jerusalem Post and former Reuters correspondent Ori Lewis, and in studio, Adam Scott Bellos, host of JNS's Wine with Adam, and founder and CEO of the Israel Innovation Fund. Now, first of all, gentlemen, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank uh, you, thank you for having us. It's my pleasure. Ori, I'm gonna start with you though. You've been covering FIFA and the World Cup for years, and Qatar was awarded hosting duties in 2010. When did the general public become truly aware of all the bribery and the mismanagement that went into Qatar's nomination? Well, it was pretty much immediate. I mean, there were other very, very good challengers, uh, bidders to host the World Cup. Um, and Qatar and Russia were the ones who, who won out. And it was pretty apparent from the get-go that, you know, this was all down to uh, some r rather... Uh, nasty or, shall we say, uh, inappropriate dealings behind the scenes that gave them uh, over Britain, uh, I think it was, or England, maybe, um, and, and other, uh, other really very worthy uh, bidders gave them the hosting. So Russia went off okay, relatively, uh, and now it's Qatar's turn, but I think that things are going to change from now on. This is not going to happen again. So uh, how, how is it allowed mm -hmm. to happen in the first place if it was made public and, and became clear immediately that there was something nefarious behind the scenes. You know, why, why, not, rescind, why not rescind hosting duties from Qatar immediately? Well, I think there was too much money involved. Uh, the moment that FIFA had made their decision, they were bound by it. And uh, there were too many contractual uh, and legal issues for them to, to go back on it. They said at the time that everything was done fairly and there was no uh, problem with it but in actual fact as time went on uh, more and more uh, issues uh, have come to light um, I think formally probably you know everything was done okay because no fault has been found uh, officially at least but in actual fact we know that the way things have been going on uh, has not been uh, in the best practice by any stretch of the imagination yeah. uh, Adam you know, what, what were your reactions to learning more and more about this? Because I know that so, you've been... So I, I remember in 2010 when this was announced and everybody was pretty shocked, right. to say the least, especially because you can't hold the World Cup in Qatar during the summer. It's, right. not, it's not possible unless you want everybody to die of heat stroke. Um, also, Amnesty International has been constantly issuing reports about what's been going on in Qatar with the slave labor and the building of the Khalifa Stadium. And I think Qatar reported 50 deaths in total since 2010. Even fewer, less Wait, than 40, I think. Right, right. And, and I believe the Amnesty, even though Amnesty has lost some credibility with their recent report on Israel, but Amnesty reported something like 400 a week mm -hmm. uh, since 2010. So um, I don't agree that it, it could have just been money issues. This is obviously like the same thing of European organizations gaslighting liberals in order to take money from uh, fundamentalists who support terrorism and do and are amongst the highest violators of human rights. Well, and and, and, that, and apparently they don't like alcohol either. No, they don't. And, and I know that we're going to be we're going to be talking about that in just a second. But I, I want to stick on the fact that uh, uh, that Oli, you mentioned that after this, FIFA and the rest of the world will have likely learned its lesson. But is that really true, judging by the fact that, you know, who, who hosted before? Was it Russia uh, in the, the previous Russia, games before Russia that? Russia was the last host. Before that, be, before that it was, um, it was uh, France, I think. But um, what, what you have to take into account, first of all, FIFA is really is a global organization. The head of FIFA at the time, Sepp Blatter, who uh, I'm, I've met on several occasions, uh, I have to say, was one of the wiliest operators I've ever met in, in any sphere um, uh, and really knew never to answer any question directly uh, and managed to get away with it. He recently has come out uh, saying that it was a mistake, but it's obviously you know way, way too late after the fact. 
one thing I would just add is that FIFA really is a, is a global organization. Yeah, it's based in Zurich, Switzerland. But, um, and the main, the most powerful soccer nations are the European nations. Uh, but it's actually uh, controlled or everybody has an equal voice. So any country from Asia, Africa, the Americas and everywhere else is equal. The thing is that the people at the top of the organization who are indeed currently uh, European and have been European for a while, um, need to keep a majority of, uh, of delegates on their side. So they're going to go and, and do whatever they can to make sure that they have everything in place, that they stay where they want to be, which is in control. I, I mean, I'm just thinking, you mentioned Seth Blatter, of course, and, and famously when he did respond to a, a question about Qatar's record on LGBT rights, he famously said, you know, don't have gay relations, basically, in Qatar. Uh, so I, I feel like there were many red flags that were just ignored, including by FIFA, of course. Uh, and the same thing, uh, Adam, you know, FIFA has been embroiled in controversy after controversy. And again, we're talking about whether or not they're going to learn their lesson, but it seems apparent that Saudi Arabia is now in the front running for the 2030 games. Yeah. You know, what, so what do you make of that? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I make of it. I mean, I mean like, I, to, to be completely honest, uh, Saudi Arabia is, I think, considered to be the number three human rights violator in the world uh, after China and Iran. And uh, they're also, they also use quite a lot of slave labor. While MBS has been trying to modernize the, the way the world sees Saudi Arabia and there's the new uh, vertical city that they're planning uh, quite soon, it, it doesn't mean... To me, they're using an international organization's largest, uh, I guess you could say, tech ass or like ceremony, so to speak. This is the largest sporting event in the world. It's the most watched sporting right. event in the history of the world. Every year, it beats out the Super Bowl. And uh, like I said earlier, governments are using this to legitimize themselves. And uh, obviously, FIFA is willing to take whatever money they need to, and the leadership of FIFA is willing to do whatever they need to do to maintain their majority. Uh, in order to appease these governments. Like you said, first it was Russia, now it's Qatar, next it'll be Saudi Arabia. So, uh, Apparently the World Cup uh, means lots of people need to die. Uh, uh, clearly, Oli? Yeah, sports washing, uh, as, as Ooh, been mentioned, absolutely. I like that, sports, uh, sports washing? Been, Very cool, it's, I like it's that, been, that's new. Been, yeah, well, yes, it's, it's been used recently. Um, and the thing is that Qatar committed to several things, including uh, the issue of, of uh, gay rights and uh, alcohol in certain areas, and then they reneged at the very, very last minute. Mm. Typically, Middle Eastern behavior, well, where well, you say something and you actually mean something else, or you say something and you don't really mean it. Uh, and, and this has uh, mm. actually been quite outrageous. Uh, Gianni Infantino, who's the head of FIFA, just uh, last week started blaming the Europeans in their colonial days yeah. for all the bad things that they've done and that they should apologize for the past 3,000 years over the next 3,000 years. I think that's, I'm sorry, but that's absolutely outrageous to say that. Um, well, and it's, it's a very, very defeatist on, uh, on the side of, you, of FIFA to have capitulated and not to have allowed or not to have insisted on the things that had been promised uh, by Qatar in the, in the forefront of uh, their bid. You know, if they say they're going to do something, they should stick to it and not just uh, unfold and then in the end or force other people to say, well, actually, we're not going to allow beer in the stadiums. Beer is, an, is a fundamental part of the game. Well, so and, it's, uh, it's, that's, uh, it's... What I thought was most interesting, though, was that um, high rollers will have access to alcohol in their suites watching the game. So, so if general, you're wealthy enough, you can still Right, if you're wealthy points. enough, you, you can, but... Uh, the tickets, just basic tickets, were going for $22,000 a piece. Mm -hmm. So people were saving for years for this, and then arriving, finding out that the World Cup is not going to be the World Cup that they've always known. It's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite an uncouth move on the Qatari government's behalf to the fans of the, the World Cup, in my opinion. Well, and so, uh, so yeah. do you think that Qatar is actually, and, and you know, I, I guess it's now a good time to say that that's, it, it's maybe in, in the, the honor of the fans who are not getting all of you, a little bit, that we're having a little bit of a, of a moment, yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> what, what are we drinking, by the way? We're, Jezreel. Drinking, the Jezreel. <laughs> We're drinking the Jezreel Valley Alpha. It's a, it's a great <laughs> blend of very wonderful full-bodied grapes. I, what, what can we, I say yeah, to all we, of you who have you been banned? Uh, so uh, sorry. Okay, but okay, but I want to now, <laughs> I do want to go back to Gianni Infantino's comments because you're right, in terms of sports washing, as you put it, uh, yeah, I want to read just a couple of things that you, that you mentioned. Of course, you said that uh, uh, Europeans, what they've been doing for 3,000 years, uh, we should be apologizing for the next 3,000 before, uh, 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 before we give moral lessons. But he also said, if you want to criticize someone, criticize me in FIFA. Don't criticize Qatar. Don't criticize the players. Don't put pressure on the coaches. Let them concentrate on football and making the fans happy. The World Cup comes only f uh, once every four years. How many chances do we have to unite the world? He went on, he said, do you want another world war? Uh, as if this is the reason that we have peace, that we need an excuse to bring people together. Do you think that, that having the game in Qatar is in any way accomplishing the goal that Gianni Infantino is even uh, trying to allude to? Well, like, in terms of the stuff you get, uh, there's, there's no point in blaming the players or the coaches or the teams or, or the participants in any way. Uh, it really is not their fault, and uh, they've turned up to play. In fact, I thought that perhaps some might at some stage initially might say, well, you know, if it's going to be in Qatar in this way, we don't want to participate. But they are contractually obligated to, uh, to, uh, to participate, and it's very, very difficult for associations to back out. So what the officials say and what the, uh, the, the actual sporting aspect of uh, the tournament uh, does are two different things. I think Infantino was in a corner. He had to get out of it. He found the best way possible. Uh, was it good enough? No, I don't think anybody has been fooled by what he said. I think the things that he said uh, are really uh, rather, uh, how shall we put it, you know, rather cowering, I think is probably the best way. Uh, he definitely wouldn't have wanted to be this way, but he's in no position to, to argue with the hosts. But they hold the cards. They're the ones who've got the money. They spent $220 billion on this uh, this tournament, which is far, far more than anybody ever did before. Well, I mean, Russia was next. Well, certainly not on, game, not on their billion. slave laborers. Uh, and they also, I mean, again... Yeah, of course. Well, and, and again, they, it, it goes beyond that. Infantino was not, not just... Uh, apologizing or even cowering to this, he's doubling down. He, I have a quote here from recently. He says, you know, we need an excuse to bring people together. If we wanted to do a tournament in Iran, we should do a tournament in Iran because maybe that would change something. He's taking, he and FIFA are taking credit for any reforms that Qatar is pretending to have made in the last 10 years. Adam? First of all, I have to say, just speaking of Iran, the best thing that I saw out of the World Cup was watching the Iranian team not sing their, their national anthem. Mm. And that was, uh, for me, an unbelievable moment to see that uh, the popular revolution. Well, we saw, we saw Iranians actually cheering for England as right, well. Right, right. It, it was, uh, to me, that was uh, an amazing moment. Like, uh, I'll remember that the rest of my life. Uh, I mean, I was deeply moved by that, but I completely agree. There are FIFA is uh, trying to take credit for any small type of reforms that have been made. It's absolutely ridiculous. They're excusing the slave labor. There have been migrants from Bangladesh, from Indonesia, from, from, from um, Nepal who have gone missing, whose families are not, uh, have no idea where their relatives are. They're, have you heard about the wage, their wages being months and months yeah. late, and they're only making about two hundred dollars a month? They have no and, showers, in and they have, and they're living eight to a room, and apparently they had to pay recruitment agencies so something like four thousand dollars, anywhere from five hundred and fifty dollars to four forty five hundred dollars just to get the job when they're only making two hundred dollars a month, and they were told they were going to be making somewhere between eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars a month. So. I, I think FIFA is actually enabling slave labor. I think FIFA is enabling the mainstreaming of a third world. Uh, I, I, I mean, Qatar is obviously not a third world country, but it is uh, a very large human rights violator, and they're excusing that. And I don't think there's any place for that in the 21st century. We live in the time of the internet, uh, freedom of access of knowledge, electricity, free running water. That should be something that every human being should have. That's almost an inalienable right, so to speak. And the idea that an organization such as FIFA uh, could um, could legitimize this type of behavior is appalling. Uh, uh, Uri, are there going to be I, any? I, I do agree. Yeah. 
I do agree. FIFA, look, there might be some small, small changes, but they're so small that they, that they you know, they, they pale into in complete insignificance uh, compared to the uh, the terrible atrocities, I think, that, that are being uh, committed, have been committed behind the scenes that we don't know about. Yes, I think that FIFA are definitely complicit in uh, in the uh, in the slave labour or modern slavery that we are now having, and it's just outrageous. It's just is you know not 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 acceptable in any way, shape, or form. It's very clear they have they have blood on their hands, and uh, I I mean like. It's not something that I want to think about because I get really depressed when I think about it. I mean, just reading the stats of the amount of people that have died, the amount of workers that have gone missing, the families that um, have no idea where their relatives are. Um, you know, people took these jobs that were migrant workers to be able to support their families from abroad, just like many people do around the world. And um, apparently, you know, I was just reading this report from Amnesty earlier today where um, this gentleman who lived in Nepal was sending money home and his salary is now six months late and his children needed to be pulled out of school and because they can't afford their education. I mean, it's just little stories like that that uh, FIFA, has completely legi FIFA has completely legitimized this type of behavior in the 21st century and it is uh, completely unacceptable. Is there going to be any sort of recourse against FIFA or Qatar for their violations, not only of their own con contractual obligations, but for the abuses that have arisen in the last 10 years? I don't, I don't think, think so. so. Uh, I think, I think <laughs> that soccer is, soccer is too big, too important to the world, and FIFA can hide behind that. And FIFA will get away with it. The Qataris, once this is all over in a month's time, everybody will have forgotten about it. Mm. Uh, and, and I just think that it's, it's, it's going to blow over. Nothing will change. Uh, the people who have suffered really badly are going to, you know, remain with those, um, you know, physical or uh, mental injuries for the rest of their lives. Um, and the rest of us who live in, in far more comfortable surroundings uh, will just uh, forget about it and go on to the next World Cup, which is going to be in the United States, I think. So, uh, I, I, again, with the way that this is working in terms of diplomatic relations as well, we see reports even here in Israel where people are so excited about the games, and of course, it's, they have, these people have every right, fans have every right to be excited about these games, but at the same time, by overlooking Qatar's abuses, it, it, seems, that, it seems that Qatar's plan to use the games as a smokescreen, as leverage, as uh, uh, you, Ori, and Adam have already alluded to, have already spoken about, it seems that their plan is working. You have Israel, Israelis. Wait, I totally disagree with you. Well, I think you have tens how, how do you of thousands think, how do you of Israelis who are, who are going to, for, just for example, right, but who are now, but, but look so excited for the fact that they can go to Qatar that you see headlines even here in Israel saying, hey, maybe this is a, a foothold to future relations with Doha. Right, but Doha was the first... I, 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 Qatar was the first place to open up an office in Doha. They were the first Gulf country to have relations with Israel. They opened up trade relations in 1996. So, like... That, that closed quite quickly, but I mean, look at the reaction to everything once people arrived to Qatar. You know, I mean, like, I'm sure you've seen the things on social well, media. They, well, they block, I mean, me, they block the media from reporting. Right, so I mean, like, I, I think that, like, everybody um, assumed this was a step in the direction of maybe Qatar joining the Abraham Accords, mm -hmm. but I think very clearly that's not going to be happening based on the fact uh, that... Uh, Qatar does not seem to be very welcoming to the Jewish people or to Israelis. They banned kosher food, mm -hmm. uh, which was very interesting. Days, bef days, days before, before. That, they did the very, same. They did the same thing that. with alcohol. Okay, they have which, denied that. They deny it, but at no, the but same but it time, did happen. There's only, it, there's it, only it, I mean, it's, well, it's been all I over. The, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like they, they, they have, they have denied it. There's no reason for them to actually uh, to, I mean, to ban kosher food. They also deny well, they slave say, labor. Well, well the, re the reason, the reasoning that I that I have found. Uh, in, in doing my own research into the topic is that they couldn't guarantee the safety of, uh, of Jewish worshipers. And again, that seems to be... Well, that's kind of a problem, it, though. It's, it seems to be the same thing that they, that they did in terms of the LGBT. Uh, again, you had uh, very famously the gay Qatari doctor who is in the United States on asylum, Dr. Naz Mohammed. He said, uh, when you add that qualifier of you have to respect our culture and tradition, although you are welcome here as LGBT fans, when you add that qualifier, it seems like a ticket out for when something goes bad because you can just deflect the blame, the blame to the victim if and when something goes wrong. 
Do you disagree, Ori? No, I don't disagree. I think that's absolutely... There is uh, definitely uh, that element that, you know, the Qataris can absolve themselves of, of any blame hap of things happening to other people in a country where LGBT people are not welcome, where uh, say the Jews are not welcome, I think, is, is, is not correct. Uh, I think um, as, long as, as long as they don't, uh, and has by, uh, been uh, said, stated by the Israeli foreign ministry, well, as I... long as they don't uh, overtly publicize, advertise that they've come from Israel, they'll be okay which to a certain extent is is uh, is not the way things should be. I mean, uh, you know, you want right. you want to be you want to be free and able to to be uh, to express yourself in any country wherever you are. Unfortunately, the reality is not not quite so simple. Mm. So, I mean, if... uh, yeah, it, it it is it is very bad. One thing I would just like to add, um I saw an interview with the Emir of Qatar quite a few years ago. Um I think it was done by Bob Simon. Uh, of blessed memory, uh, who's, who um, and the Emir told him that uh, we as Qataris, we're a small country, we don't have a big army, we can't really fight anybody, we want to be friends and, uh, and uh, on the right side of everybody. So basically, they're looking to be, to get, you know, to gain an advantage from all sides, play all sides against each other, as long as they stay, you know, they stay out of trouble. So the Qataris have their own agenda. Right. Um, they work in, you know, in a way that that is that suits them, uh, and they they know that they can get away with it because they have so much final, money. Final comment. I, I would just say uh, before I give you my final comment, the, the things that I've seen on social media, especially out of a lot of anti-Zionist feeds, um, it's very clear that there are a lot of people there specifically to harass Israelis because they knew that Israelis would show up. Um, and, and I think it's absolutely disgusting. And I think in the 21st century, uh, propping up human rights violators, slave labor, um, I, I, you know, the uh, false advertisement of what uh, the World Cup would be based on the values of the World Cup and the secular values of FIFA, I think it's just a, uh, I don't think it's right. I think it's, I think it's, com a complete, I think it's become a complete disaster. I think this will fall back on FIFA very poorly, in my All right. opinion. All right. Well, Adam, Ori, thank you both so, so much again for joining us. It was wonderful to have you in this conversation. And of course, everybody at home, thank you for watching. I'm Aaron Forrest. This was ILTV's Insider. And please tune in next time for more on everything Israel. And don't forget to let us know in the comments online if there's a topic that you would like us to cover next. And again, thank you so much. Make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at ILTV.tv. I'm Aaron Forrest. And we'll see you next time.